I love getting to come to conferences and speak to people about what I do, which is, oh, you know, writing and stuff. Um, because uh, the people who have had to work on writing really difficult things, they, they're like, wait, wait, it could have meant anything. And then I had to work with my privacy professionals, and I had to work with my legal counsel, and I had to work with the product owner who wanted to sell it things. <gasps> How do I get the words to work? And it's hard. I've been doing it for nine years, and uh, I got to start because a writing manager talked me into it and said, you've been explaining abstract concepts to teenagers with a test at the end. Come work at Xbox. <laughs> so in this talk, I'll talk about what UX content is good for. And by UX content, I really mean the words inside the interfaces that we're building. Uh, I'll talk about how to tell if it's any good. And I'll talk about who is responsible for it. This covers uh, a few of the topics. It's really a couple of the chapters in the book. So first, what UX content is good for? It's pretty simple. We need good UX content to meet both business and customer goals. And I think that's been a theme I've heard throughout all of these. It's like, we need to be user-centered. We need to keep them at the center of everything and give them what they need and they want and meet their goals and identify their goals before we start. And we get to do that because we are meeting business goals. So let me break down what I mean by those business goals. Uh, and for an example, I'm going to be using this uh, quite a bit. This app, I invented three different apps for the book. This one is uh, the most straightforward. It is a transit app. Now, raise your hand if you use transit wherever you, it is you live. Yeah, is there an app associated with that? Like, can you, yeah. So various ways to get there, and usually they should be very straightforward and usable by anybody. So the goals of the people who use my fictional transit app, I'm not in naming, by the way. <laughs> um, they want to search for routes. They want to buy bus passes in this fictional app. They can buy a bus pass that uses a QR code to then pay, and they can pay the fare when they're on the bus. Now, why does the TAP organization, the TAP transit system, make this? Because they have the goal, because they want to use this app data to help them plan their bus routes, to help them maintain their funding uh, for this civic system to keep costs low and ridership high. Super simple. So this is an example of an app where we actually know our goals. It's not always what we get to do. But, what we generally know for any organization or business, they're following this cycle. They want to attract people, right? They want people to know about it and use it. They want to convert those people who they've attracted, who are now aware of it, into people who actually download the app or use the experience or ride the bus. Those people need to be onboarded into the experience. So pe like getting people from that download into actually starting it engage them in it. If things break, the organization wants to support it. And they want to be transformed then into uh, hopefully repeat customers uh, and maybe buying the next version of it or bringing their family along or helping their friends understand or being enthusiasts. But what the people are trying to do is different than what the organization is trying to do. But it's related. Where the business or the organization is trying to attract have you ever looked at online dating? Sometimes people put stuff up there going, I'm going to be super attractive. Attract, attract, attract. And those people are not particularly interesting to the people who are coming up who are investigating, right? So we need to be building our interfaces for, their, uh, for that user purpose of investigating. They're going to verify what's going on. They're going to commit to it. Then they need to set it up, use it, fix it if things break. We hope they don't break. But hopefully, like, and sometimes people come to like champion this thing and be like, you have got to ride the bus. It is so much easier than finding parking, right? Fantastic. For every stage around this journey, there is content that organizations make. Up here at the Attract and Investigate, 
there's ads, there's articles, there's white papers, there's tweets and posts, there's all of those things that we do to drive awareness. In order to verify and commit, people will read endorsements and reviews and look for those product ratings. They want that sales collateral sometimes. If you're looking for a new dishwasher, you actually end up reading sales collateral. Then you want your get started guys, your first run, your how to, and sometimes that's as simple as starting up an app and having it just say, hey, the first thing you need to do is add a phone number, great. When you are engaged, you're going to be using it. You need those titles and buttons and descriptions. You might still need the how-to, especially if it's that dishwasher. I'm just saying. If it's inside a rich content experience, like a game, you'll also have game content. Those alerts then bleed over into the troubleshooting and error messages that help you fix uh, and, and move forward. And then all the things that make the experience sticky, whether that's badges and profile ratings that you accrue, or the training or conferences. Like there are, uh, for example, eBay, you can go to seller training from eBay, right? Because that makes people into champions. Now, this slide is intended to be overwhelming. This, I've, I've actually had designers come up to me afterwards, so I just want to reassure you, like, intentionally overwhelming. This is the kind of content that content people are creating. Now, can, should one content person be responsible for all of that? Have you gone to some content person in your organization and said, you're really good at this copy stuff, can you help me with mine? I bet you have. So, my point is, is that all of this is very, very different. And we can specialize it in very different ways. What I focus on is the user experience content. And that is everywhere from that get started guide to it's after the funnel of sales and commitment. And it's everything from those get started guides and how to through those profile ratings and badges and troubleshooting. All of that is part of the user experience that we can design and we can design that content to be maximally effective uh, for both the customer and the business and be on brand. Go fig. So how do we tell if it's any good, right? Well, there's two main ways I'm going to talk about. We're going to predict how well it meets, will meet its goals, and we're going to measure how well it meets its goals. So predicting how well it meets its goals, I'm going to talk heuristics. So the heuristics for the, like from Nielsen Norman Group and from others, uh, we can apply them in two big categories, usability and voice. So usability, very, very straightforward, right? We just need it to be accessible, purposeful, concise, conversational, and clear. Super easy, but what does that mean? Well, in the, in the book, I broke it down, and I, this is based on a scorecarding exercise that I've done for a few years. Um, trying to figure out like why heuristically is a set of content through a user experience not working. And I really mean not you, like the set of content like here are all the help pages, although it works with that. I mean walking through the flow to print a spreadsheet. So is it accessible? For accessibility, I really want to talk about three things. Uh, separate from all of the other uh, ways that we, uh, all of the web standards for accessibility, um, except for one. One, every element should be able to be spoken, every screen element should be able to be heard. So everything, like if it has an existence, even if it's just an icon, give it a word in text, and we heard about that yesterday. Related to that, it should be available in the languages the people using it are proficient in. If we are just making it available in the majority language, so in the US, that's frequently English, if we are only making it available in English, who are we leaving out and why? Do we not like their money? I think we like their money. And I think we want to include them as part of the population. And certainly for a transit app, we better. So for it to be accessible, it must be available in those languages. Also, the reading level should be below seventh grade. What does that translate to here? 
I don't even know. It's like middle school for us. Yeah? Okay. So below seventh grade for consumer and below 10th grade for professional audiences. That is difficult. And there are readability and analyzers uh, for English and then different ones available for uh, different languages and they are all available on Wikipedia, which is my go-to source for, wait, which, how do I spell Flesh Kincaid? Um, so, screen readers, languages, and reading level. Purposeful. The organization's goals are met and the people's goals are met. If you have not defined those goals, you have a different problem. And you should go back to it. Like if you're finding those in an audit of your content, time to, time to dig deeper. It should be concise. Your content in your experiences should be concise. And I've got a couple of definitions for those. One of them is just absolute length. Don't go wider, and I mean on mobile device or on big screens. Don't go wider than 50 characters in English. And don't go deeper than two and a half lines. I mean, deep, three lines actually, but then you get it to three lines and then people can't scan it. And it is all about the scannability. It's about the primacy and the recency that we just heard about from Dominic, or as I like to call it, primacy and lastency. For content, when you have those descriptive text chunks, people will notice the first word and pay attention to the last word and everything else provides context. It's bizarre and it happens all the time. So, absolute length, 53, and then information that is presented has to be actually relevant to that person right then. Not like, oh, we should really tell them that. Like, make sure you'll hear from your product owner. Make sure you also tell them about this other feature that nobody's using. No, not until that product owner works on making that feature relevant to that person in that moment. So, conversational. By conversational, I do not mean chatty. I do not mean uh, casual. I mean that humans work with each other in this method we call a conversation, and our apps should respect that, right? We do turn-taking in conversations as a very natural thing that happens worldwide in every single language. Maybe our apps should too, and we can. Uh, we should also make sure we're using the words and ideas and concepts that people are familiar with. I love going to user research, uh, like studies, at the very beginning discovery phases, when even a lot of user researchers are saying like, really, you wanna come? Okay. It's like, we don't, it's in the, we don't know what we're gonna find and like, out of every 10 hours, we're gonna have one hour of useful interaction. Fine, that's when I want to be there as the UX writer because as the researcher, like in interview formats, as the researcher and the subjects are speaking to each other and trying to even figure out what the conversation is about, that's when those subjects will be using the words that they already know, that they apply to this concept, which will be different words than my business partners and my engineers. If I can learn those words, then I can embed those in the experience later on, respecting that research that we got and bringing it back to them. Super handy. Uh, so I'm using their words, I'm using them briefly, I'm doing it in a conversational way, and I need to present these things in a logical order to them. So imagine for our TAP app, our transit app, imagine these two sets of instructions. To pay your bus fare, scan the QR code that happens or that appears when you tap pay fare. Are you all a little bit confused about what to do? To pay your bus fare, get on the bus, tap pay fare, then scan your QR code. Those are all the same phrases in a different order, in the order people would actually use them. So, conversational. Let's talk about clear. 
Here's one that all my design buddies should know, that actions should have unambiguous results. To make them unambiguous, we usually need to use words, because nobody knows what that icon means until they've seen it a few times. Like, for serious. They also need to know that the how-to and the policy information is easy to find. We do so much to increase the feeling and perception of clarity when we say, hey, if you need it, the how-to content is here. I don't want to measure that based on how many people actually clicked into the how-to content. I want to measure it based on how many people complete the flow when that link is visible, because it builds their confidence. And confidence is critical. So uh, the error messages is also part of clarity. It should have error messages. Nobody knows it's an error message until you tell them it's an error message, right? It could just be a like helpful sign, like, hey, to do the thing you want to do, press that button. Yeah, it'll be great. So uh, when we can't move the person forward there, we should at least make it clear that they can't. And that's the error message's job, not to indicate to the developer who's looking at it later uh, necessarily, like, hey, there was a uh, line fault at something, technical jargon something. <laughs> so speaking of technical jargon, as part of clarity, the same term should mean the same concept every time the person sees it. Also, the same concept should use the same term. And this is a really interesting audit to do, especially in professional document or professional UI, because people will be like, oh, actually, I was having a lunchtime conversation that many uh, government agencies in New Zealand are ministries, but then are referred to as departments. Right? Check out your content and see if it's consistent. So. That was usability, let's talk about voice. In voice, we wanna talk about our concepts, we wanna talk about the vocabulary we're using, the verbosity, the grammar, the punctuation, and the capitalization. This gets a lot more complicated when we are dealing with spoken voice because we also have different tones and pauses and limits, it's crazy sauce. But when we're just dealing with words on a screen, we should have the concepts that matter. So let's talk about the voice should be consistent and recognizable. You should know that you are in that experience. You should know when you go to your bank's website that they are not, that they are your bank, right? They should be talking about banking things, not about non-banking things, right? You expect them to uh, reinforce concepts like saving money, spending wisely, getting small business loans, those sorts of things. That is part of your voice, and you can define that ahead of time. You should also think about the vocabulary. Do you call people people in your experiences, or customers, or citizens? Do you call them users? If it's a game, do you call them players? If it's a movie, do you call them watchers? Like, what do you call the people what do you use, like what vocabulary do you use and can you use it consistently to hold up these ideals? The verbosity. We just heard from Dominic about being concise and being brief. I'm gonna tell you that is a choice for your voice. That rhymed. So if you go to your bank and it uses, I, I just learned this New Zealand slang of sweet as. Okay, that's a thing. If your bank was full of your New Zealand slang, that might be really cool in the marketing copy. It might be really cool in, you know, they're, they're putting out a new product for something. But you would want them to use it sparingly when it comes to your investment opportunities or your planning for retirement, possibly. And here is where verbosity really comes in handy. Like, you can use brief slang and you can, uh, and this is all a, a very important choice for your voice. And sometimes it's just like, no, I'm reading about retirement options. I better see that it's not just, you'll be fine when you're old, although that's all they're promising. 
you'll be fine when you're old, and give me details about why you think that's true. The grammar, I mean, in general, we want to use in English very simple grammar, very direct statements. But if you want to create a different feeling, like your bank or your government agency might decide, like, here is a scary thing, so we're going to use scary, long, complex sentences because you really shouldn't go in this way. Actually, I've seen this used in IT Pro places, like, you're going to, you're setting up a thing, and this is a destructive action. You're setting up your, your database, and you're setting one up, and you're taking another one down. Here you're about to take a destructive action. You're going to get a dialogue with a title that's long and some long descriptive text with exclamation points, bolded words. And it's going to be long so that you know it's important. We're funny. Cap punctuation and capitalization frequently has been defined by a design organization who has never talked to a writer. And they have stayed like this. But if you are somebody who text messages, you probably use punctuation very, very intentionally, right? Or if you're writing a business letter, here's a sentence with an exclamation point, and another with a period so that you know I'm serious, and another with another period to reinforce that point, but here's a sentence with an exclamation point just so that you know I'm still excited. All of these things for your voice can be defined ahead of time and should be, and your UI can be measured against what you believe your voice should be. So when we go to actually not just try to predict how well it will behave, but measure how well it behaves, I'm going to go back to this slide. I'm going to go back to this cycle, because we should be looking at how well do we keep people in this cycle. So, we're going to use not just the goals for the, the TAP app, for the customer in the business, but we're going to say, where do those overlap? What are the key behaviors that we absolutely must have humans do for them to be successful and for the business to be successful? So key behaviors here are searching for the route, buying the bus pass, and paying the fare. When we are talking about onboarding, and I loved what I heard earlier about onboarding, yes, it goes the whole length of your process. You are most concerned about it as people are coming in to the, as, you know, from that moment of, of downloading and committing to like, do they ever become engaged people? But the way we can measure it is two ways uh, related to those key behaviors, how long how much time passes for the average user before they have completed all three key behaviors. That is a measurable thing. We need to instrument uh, our experiences so that we can get that data, but that is instrumentable. We can also just measure how long before they take the first one and which one is the first one that most people take. This is data we can get about onboarding and when we make changes, and here's a secret, when we make changes to the UI content, we are also making changes to the UI, right? We never just make changes to the words. We are changing the experience itself. So we do that, uh, and we change the first run, we change the how-to articles, and we get it. Uh, we can make fundamental changes. We can A-B test that. So. Similarly, we're gonna, we can change the titles, buttons, descriptions, game and experience content for engagement. We can A, B test which one is working better. What is our measure of engagement? We're measuring those key behaviors. How many people, so the monthly active users and daily active users, how that, that really isn't useful at an app level for a UI designer or for a UX writer. But at the, the behavior level, it really works for us because we can say, hey, did more people uh, today use search? Great. Did more in group A or group B? Great, let's move forward. But it's not just using it, it's getting to that step of completion. And that sort of, uh, it goes beyond that monthly active use and goes into, did they get what they needed? 
Did they do a search but never pay, uh, buy a fare or pay a fare? Could, should we alert them that this is a possibility for them? We can also work on retention, right? If we know that something bad has happened uh, in that, uh, in the experience, if we've been, if we know we are giving error messages or a thing has broken, we can measure how many people come back, and we should, and we should improve that content, and it's almost exclusively content, right? If you're sending a text message uh, or an app notification, you don't have your beautiful IA, you barely have any branding except what you can carry in your content, which is why that voice is so important. So your badges and profile ratings help keep people in. People with more badges in apps like OfferUp and eBay, other e-commerce sites, uh, tend to stay longer. We can also measure referrals. Referrals can be, uh, is almost entirely a text play because we are in general, uh, if we do referrals as a UX motion, it is tell your friends. And maybe you hit that button and it pre-populates a Facebook post or a Twitter post or a text message and the text that it pre-populates had better sound like your customer right, because they are not going to send a text to their mom that doesn't sound like them, because they do not want to hear about being hacked. So, we've talked about how to tell if UX content is good, both in a predictive way and in a measurement way. But who's responsible for doing that? Well, ah, too much content. Maybe you are a team of one. Maybe you are a founder and coder and developer and you, it is you and you are writing your product pages and your customer hopefully is writing some reviews and you are writing the titles and buttons and error messages and descriptions and all of the rest of it is not getting written because it's just you and you have to sleep sometime. Now, maybe you have a startup size organization and you have a marketer and they are driving this train and you still have a customer, great. And you might have a designer and or product person who's doing this writing. Okay, and your engineer is writing the error messages and the troubleshooting late at night. Now, in a very large company with an army of people, you might have subject matter experts and forum moderators and trainers and all sorts of things. You might even have a UX writer. Although, earlier today, I saw that you know, there's, what, 40-some thousand jobs for full-stack developers and 20-some thousand jobs for UX designers and only 2,000 jobs posted worldwide for UX researchers. Anybody want to know how many UX writer jobs are posted worldwide <laughs> as of my LinkedIn search this morning from the audience? 200. <laughs> so, so, yes, UX researchers, I feel your pain. <laughs> We're right there. There's also a lot of confusion between tech writing and UX writing and marketing writing. Who should be doing that? Who's responsible for it? And look how different it is what they're doing and at different stages in what the customer's doing. I've had people tell me, okay, I, I could just say product owners. Um, we have this beautiful glossy brochure from marketing and a great marketing video. Let's just use those for our how-to. Uh, it was fun to illustrate how, why that wouldn't work. So critical skills for UX writers. And most of you, I, I speak to you knowing that most of you are doing this work, right? Like, raise your hand if you are responsible for the words in your designs. Yeah. So y'all are UX writers. Hopefully you have a facility with language. It's easy for you to rearrange words in grammar. I just said that sentence. I'm a professional writer. <laughs> you can say, oh, I'm going to say not to do the thing, do this, but I'm going to say do this to do the thing, right? You're going to have, it's going to be easy for you to move words and concepts around and test out five different areas, uh, five different ways to write things. You're going to have empathy for users. You're going to be developing that collaboration skill. And like everybody, 
who professionally does UX, you're gonna have a heck of a lot of persistence. But UX writers come from everywhere. Sometimes they are technical and marketing writers who move into it. But just like UX design and UX research are full-time jobs, UX writing, I mean, y'all may have noticed that your designs don't work without words on them. And I know that designs don't work when they don't have information architecture and a solid use of color and, and all of the other wonderful things that designers bring. Journalists make great UX writers. School teachers, designers, a database analyst uh, named Michelle Mooney taught me my job and she has gone on to be a product owner in Xbox. Uh, UX writers come from everywhere. To build UX writing experience on the job and freelance work, that is less available now uh, because even though there's only 200 of these jobs posted worldwide and uh, 10 years ago or nine years ago when I started, you couldn't advertise for it because nobody knew what that was. Somewhere in between, uh, somebody had the bright idea to post jobs that say, oh, you need three to five years experience for this. So there are in-person classes, there are remote classes and trainings. Um, there are online challenges and communities that you can join and, and you can build your portfolio and say, this is how it was written and this is how I can write it. When we are talking about UX writing, like what does it matter? What does it matter that, the, that there's only these 200 jobs? Well, we need this to be isolated the same way UX research needed it to be isolated, even though we are all UX researchers, so that we can specialize, so that we know what that skill set is, so that our teams know what the engagement model is without having to train every team I join, like, hey, you've never had a UX writer. We need job descriptions, salaries, expectations. We need to know our business value, all of that. Good stuff. But when it comes down to it, what UX writers are trying to do is the same thing that you're trying to do, which is create content that meets the business and customer goals. So thank you very, very much. If you want stickers, I have more stickers. <laughs>